to another episode of Access to Perspectives Conversations. And welcome Kate Thorpe today, a therapist and therapeutic coach. And today we will hear a lot about mental well-being and how to stay healthy and up and running in challenging or not so challenging working environments. Welcome Kate, it's a great pleasure having you here. Oh, thanks so much, Joe. It's really great to be here and I'm really looking forward to talking about my favorite subjects in the world. So <laughs> absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. So some of our listeners who have listened to previous episodes might know that we've already covered uh, a few around mental well-being and stress and um, challenging situation, especially during the PhD or in academic life in general. You're not necessarily specialized for academics, but um, you work with professionals and um, like individuals and corporates of all across all this, not only disciplines, but across all professions, as I understand. But from our understanding, it's also that the, the issues that people run into when they're under pressure are quite similar, if not the same. And in academia, there's not much, um, not many relief stations or not much ex not many access points to be able or allow ourselves to seek help, which is why we're very happy to hear from an expert now <laughs> in what are uh, mit mitigational approaches one or we can take ourselves. Yeah, and I I think it's what what I've learned is that yes, well I'm I'm not an expert in academics specifically. Um, what I've learned with working from people from a lot of different professions um, and situations in life is that whatever profession you're in, whatever work it is that you're doing and however you're doing that, you are still the same. You are still human. Mm -hmm. And as a human being, we respond to stress. Mm -hmm. um, and there are many similarities in how we do that, even though our particular experience of stress or anxiety is, of course, unique to ourselves. And so in that sense, it's it's not irrelevant where the stress comes from, um, but it's more how we deal with it as a human being and recognize that in that way, we are all connected with each other. Mm. Um, and I think that's really important. It's, it's a message that can often get lost as people think, oh, this is my profession. This is terrible. This is my profession and nobody understands. Whereas mm -hmm. actually we can all understand what stress feels like we can all understand what anxiety and depression feels like and mm. desperation and all of those horrible things so it's a human condition i think rather than a professional condition and yeah and we, through my personal experience also and by looking into the topic from yeah more as an observer but also as a patient or a, a person who's struggling with um the makers was depressive episodes um, which might also recur in the future and never sure if they've gone for good or not and also likely to recur um, but that's a different story for another time and all the <laughs> um, but what I've learned is also I feel it's like a, a handbrake or a, an emergency stop for from in our brain to yeah, just to take a, not only a break from what's stressing us but to yeah, maybe not so also not to reset the system, but to to allow us to breathe for a couple of weeks and reconsider our um our life structure, like with challenging ourselves too much and then to assess and hopefully under guidance, um some of us manage ourselves, but um there's no harm in finding guidance and a professional to help us find a balance again to where we don't challenge, over over challenge ourselves through the working environment absolutely i think that's right and when you're saying that stress is sometimes a sign for us to take a break and take a step back that's that's right it's feeling stress or feeling anxiety or um all of those things it is a message it's a message from your brain and your body that something has to change uh because the uh, pressure that is being applied is too much and, and you're feeling it. Um, if you can hear that message, then you can act on it. 
mm. then you can do something. But so many of us are taught that, um, you know, phrases like diamonds are formed under pressure mm. is one that I heard very recently. And that may be true, but we're human beings. We're not diamonds. We're not meant to function under consistent high massive levels of stress and pressure it, it's not really how we're made a certain amount of stress and pressure is a good thing yes and we can channel that but it's recognizing the difference between healthy motivational excitement and stress and toxic negative burnout stress and recognizing which of those states that that you are in and then when you recognize the difference, then you can do something about it. Absolutely take the step back. And if you are finding that the, the toxic burnout stress is continuing and it never seems to go away and it's always the same, despite um, the, the, the thoughts and feelings of when I finish this thing, I will be OK. When I finish that next project or do this next piece of work, then I'll be OK. If, if that's not happening and you're finding that's a repetitive thing, then the chances are that, yes, it will help to step back and seek some support and guidance uh, mm -hmm. because none of us are meant to do this alone. As human beings, we are tribal creatures. We have evolved to be tribal. Mm -hmm. We need the tribe. We need other people. And sometimes we need people who are specialized in something. Mm -hmm. And that sounds odd, oddly self-serving because I, I'm a therapist. So, of course, I want everybody to have a therapist. But you know, we go to the dentist when our teeth ache and we go to the doctor when we've got an injury. And it's just the same with mental health. But I think the stigma that exists with mental health and what will people think of me if if I see my doctor about my stress or if I see a therapist about my stress, um, that can often hold us back. So that there is a stigma, but it's it's part of my goal and my passion to reduce that to get rid of it because as i say it all boils back down to us being human beings and recognizing our humanity and our frailty and that's something that we can all share together and in fact i would say that recognizing stress and recognizing when it's positive recognizing when it's negative in the way that it impacts us that's not a frailty that's a real strength because then it gives us an opportunity to make a change that's right and that's healthy. And that means we can then avoid going down that burnout track. Mm. Um, and I think that's that's true for everyone. In my yeah. yeah, I think so too. And in academia, I always see or the big, the golden grail is for many of us, um, the Nobel Prize. And that seems unreachable and yet everybody is working towards it. <laughs> and then you see those people who receive it are individuals and they must have gotten there with no help whatsoever. So researchers are presumably expected to just do the research on their own behalf and be successful. And yet it's, it's not only a team effort, but there's hundreds and thousands of individuals involved, not only the researchers, but if it's about um, bioscience, it's the whole lab stuff, mm. um, administration, um, the manufacture of the research equipment, like there's a whole league of individuals who contribute to the success of a research project. And then one person gets the prize or maybe two or three for one bigger achievement. And yeah. also like many researchers forget that, but there's also the saying staying, standing on the shoulders of giants. So the success of one researcher again, is hundreds and thousands of working hours in the laboratory of again hundreds and thousands of other researchers in the past that we learn from and can then continue acquiring knowledge about natural systems or social systems or whatever discipline we are studying so what you just said we're social animals we need each other we we work well in community and working well meaning mentally but also actually working well <laughs> because we <laughs> collaborate <laughs> Yeah, I would like to, like, if you don't mind, would you share with us how you got into the position and um, what made you so so aware of the topic and for you to find uh, an approach for you to help others pull through? Yeah, sure. Happy to. Um, I was, I, I've, I've been a therapist for uh, nearly six years now, but before that, um, I'd love to say I'm in my 20s, but that would be a lie. I'm in my late 40s and that's all I'm saying about that. Um, but for 20 years, I was a solicitor, um, which in the UK is a word for a lawyer. 
And that is a, a very high pressure demanding job. And I went into that career because my well-meaning parents said, go and be a lawyer, Kate, because you'll be rich and happy. Well, sadly, I was neither. Uh, it didn't work out that way. It was very high pressure. And um, ultimately, I was a square peg trying to fit into a round hole. And I didn't realize that it. it took me a very long time to recognize it. Actually, this isn't very good for me. I would suffered from anxiety from a very early age as well. But back in those days, it wasn't named for what it was. It was named for being difficult or challenging or just get over yourself or uh, work harder and, and that kind of thing. So um, I sort of took that childhood of anxiety and brought it into my legal career. And my mental health really, really suffered over those 20 years with a lot of anxiety and depression and then recovery and then being depressed again. And and that's it's sort of a textbook cyclical nature of anxiety and depression, because what I didn't do is I didn't get to the root cause of what was behind it. I just took the antidepressants or took the anxiety pills, um, felt a little better and thought, right, I'm OK now, came off them. And then the original issues came back. So that was a cycle of my life for many years. Um, until one day I, I met a therapist. I, I finally realized after I'd hit, hit rock bottom and thought, yeah, if I come back here again, I won't be getting up. So I, it really brought it home to me that I needed to do something about this situation more than just, you know, take the pills. And that was a big thing because I was actually really scared about it. I was scared about what I might find, what I might discover, what I might have to relive, what I might have to feel. Mm -hmm. um, so finding the right therapist was of paramount importance. Um, and I, I, I worked with a, a, a two or three until I found the one that was right for me. And when that happened, it was it was hard, but it was incredible in terms of the transformation for me to be able to overcome some of the demons, some of the trauma that had occurred that had um, been affecting me all my life. But because I was so much older, I said, well, that was all in the past. So mm -hmm. I'm over it now. Yeah. Um, and actually recognizing that, no, I wasn't. And there was, you know, there was still that to deal with in an in a healthy emotional way and working with my therapist allowed me to do that when I had made that level of recovery it really came home to me that I couldn't stay in this profession any longer because I was living someone else's dream not my own dream um so there was no wonder that I had a lot of imposter syndrome yeah. and so I woke up one morning after a couple of years of really thinking hard about it I had a light bulb moment I thought, why am I not doing therapy? Because that's what I wanted to do when I left school. And um, as I say, my well-meaning parents steered me away from that rocky path and said I should go and have a proper stable um, uh, income generating profession. And um, so I went back to school and I studied uh, weekends and um, gained my therapy qualifications and as soon as I was able to practice, uh, I did. Uh, that's a story in itself that I won't bore you with, but I've never looked back since. And I am so, so happy that I was able to make that transition, but I couldn't have done that and had all of those realizations had I not have had the help and support mm. of really amazing therapists and people. As a result of that, my life now is completely different. Um, it's 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 alien in many ways compared to to the life that I used to live uh, but it's very much more authentic and I feel like me I feel like I am almost a whole person mm -hmm. and that before I was play acting I was play acting a role that other people expected me to be and the joy and the gratitude for being able to be real and authentic and now to help people in the way that I received help mm -hmm. um well, there's nothing like it. There really isn't. It, it's a joy. It's a privilege. And it, it really is my passion because I'm living proof, living proof that the that these things work. I'm living proof that there is another side, that there is an end to it, that um, things can change for the better. And even though that might feel a bit scary, the rewards are absolutely worth it. So that's why I do what I do. And the, the way that I practice is unique for the individual I'm working with because I'm a bit of a learning junkie so I'm always liking you know I'm loving to learn new things and new ways of doing things and because everyone's unique then um, we all need a, a personal touch in the way that we work to heal ourselves mm. um, 
And that's not going to be the same for everybody. What works for one person isn't going to work for the next person terribly well. So it's finding the right way for the individual. And that's why I, I practice um, in, in a variety of different ways to reflect that so my client can then benefit. Um, but as I say, the joy for me to know that there is another side, there is a place of healing uh, has just brought me to the knowledge that everyone can heal. Mm. What that healing looks like may be different for each person, but it is my view that everyone can heal. It's my belief and it's that that guides me um, in the work that I do. And uh, I can't imagine ever mm. doing anything else. You know, th th this this feels this feels like it's uh, it was meant to be and, you know, loving doing it. Yeah. Um, but it, I think it helps to um, I, I don't share my story with all my clients of course because that, that's not always appropriate but sometimes I think it, it's it's helpful for clients to see that story say on my website and think ah well perhaps she knows a little bit about it so um can understand what it feels like and I think yeah. all of that experience I had just helps me helps me in the work so that that's a sort of long story of how I got here <laughs> <laughs> then I think also um if we dig deep enough or when people let down of their armor uh let their armor down, then everybody is carrying their baggage and their story and their trauma of some sort. I uh, I wanted to come back to two or three things of what you said. One was like you said, like when people think they get over it just because they're not older and whatever they live through as children or adolescent um, people mm -hmm. it, it will never heal unless we work through them and we keep getting triggered and sometimes it's just a gesture sometimes it's a word somebody says and we're triggered and we get startled and and then freeze and can't sometimes even understand ourselves what's happening so therefore it is necessary to find a way to yeah to to overcome and actively work through these traumas whatever the the trauma might have been and mm -hmm. in my experience is also like I it sounds a bit spiritual but it's also like very much real because um as a German I think our whole, I think every nation has its has its trauma from however mm -hmm. recent or or far um history but my great grandmother was killed um by the Nazi regime so that was basically um yeah like a recurring story and she was celebrated as a heroine but also she gave her life for a bigger purpose um yeah. and that you can say wow and us being proud of her and it's, it's true at the same time it's a it's a trauma for the family and yeah. across generations because my aunt like she was decaptivated i don't know if that's the right term like her head was chopped up mm. um and my aunt says, like, whenever a doctor or somebody comes near her neck, she she goes like, no, don't touch me, <laughs> like because mm -hmm. of it. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's it's real, and in us, in her ancestors, or in her and her offspring, and her like from her as an ancestor. And then, so that's a drama that I also had to think through. I had plenty of conversations with friends, and also spoke with one of the other therapists about it. So that's one thing. Also, the other thing that like to have a therapy is an opportunity to build trust, a trustful relationship over time. And mm. it can sometimes be a one-time consultation that already helps to loosen the knot and allows us to continue without much, like to, yeah, to free up some space where otherwise we were entrapped. Mm. But then for the real issues, I think we need, yeah. I mean, the therapy approach makes a lot of sense because then we literally have somebody who can take our hands and guide us through. And yeah, you know, there is a yes. And um, I think that's important is that the not all therapists are the same, far from it. Um, so it is important to find the one that you click with. If yeah, you decide that you're at a place where you you think actually I could do with a bit of support it might not necessarily be the first one that you make contact with and that's okay it's almost like um, going on a first date you know you don't marry the person that you go on the first date with you know you have to get to know them a while and it's it's not dissimilar 
um in in working successfully with a therapist that you click with but mm. that is just so so important to do that mm. um, and you know I'm, I'm so sorry to hear about that uh, your your great grandmother I mean that's I never that's knew her I didn't think it affects me so much but so she's family and she's very like sort of famous also in the anti-nazi community but, but I, um, I imagine it would bring that whole um trauma of that time it makes it very personal even mm. if you don't know her it makes it very personal to you and your family and you know we, when we talk about trauma we often think of something major something big like that or um, you know we might think of trauma as being abuse or living in a war zone and of course there's all of these these traumas happening in the world at, at the moment but trauma isn't always um a huge event like that um sometimes it's a series of of an ongoing situation mm. um, and trauma really when we talk about trauma and um, a good way of defining it is that it's an injury it's an emotional injury or a mental injury mm. um and it's usually brought about because of too much of something or too little of something and there are some kinds of traumas that can be passed down generations and that's generational trauma as you've, as, as you've described um but trauma takes a lot of forms and the vast majority of us to be fair have experienced trauma of some kind but we don't recognize it as trauma because we can compare ourselves to other people and think oh well their situation is worse than mine look at me what have i got to be worried about I've got a roof over my head. I've got a job. I've got a career. I've got a partner. I've got a dog. I've got children. I've got you know all of these things. Mm -hmm. but that doesn't take away from the fact that actually, um, the way that you're feeling might be, might be well as the result of trauma that is perhaps unrecognized or, um, put into the category of oh well that was such a long time ago now and it didn't really affect me and I've dealt with it and it's fine. Yeah, and I've been just bullying but bullying is cruel like it's mm. cool for little children and uh, i don't know so it can be as so this is also where i wanted to go because now that we have exact um established that scientists are also human beings we are not wrong. oh yes we're not <laughs> um so we come with all the human baggage along mm. in the laboratories and offices um and then are expected for the most part by ourselves to function and to be researchers who society mm. looks up to when anything happens like a pandemic now tell us what's what what are we going to do and they're like well i don't know because we we are literally at the brink of knowledge so we need to figure it out slowly but steadily and we don't know mm. time so better be fast so there's a lot of pressure <laughs> yeah the pandemic um related research just one example anyways so so we also established a few reasons where and how human beings can run into traumatic situations. Sometimes as siblings who don't get along so well and then carry on disadvantages or or competition um, between them and the parents into adulthood. So like you said, it can be seemingly small but have a huge impact on our life. And yeah, yeah. Um, but now, as professionals, and in our case, academics and scholars, mm -hmm. but from your experience, really any professional, because, oh, also, maybe the other thing is what what dif differentiates between the professions. Do you think it's important to identify the pressure points and the potential triggers? And the triggers can, of course, not necessarily have to do with the underlying trauma or also, there mm. might not have to be a big traumatic event in the past, but the constant pressure is a trauma traumatizing experience in itself. Is that mm. um, yeah, no, that, 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 that does make sense. And yes, it's right. It isn't um, trauma isn't always needed, to be fair. Um, to create anxiety, uh, but it's often plays a part of it, and it's often the case that the trauma happens when we're young, because when we when we're very young, under the age of seven or eight, we don't have the resources to cope with it in the same way that we do as as we grow into to adulthood. Um, but my mind is wandering now, so I'm veering off the question. Just remind me again what your question yeah, was. No, I wasn't really finished in asking the question. Oh, so, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, like I, I was drifting 
I was drifting in two or three directions. So um, the question would would be eventually how, like, with or without trauma or stress in a working environment, how we can now build, now that we realize, okay, the situation is not great, I need to do something about it. Mm. Um, what, what can we do? Like, when is the, when is the point where you, like from your experience also with your clients, mm. um, it takes a while from realizing like I'm not comfortable, I, I'm not functional as I know I can mm -hmm. normally, but now things are going out of hands and I feel yeah. like um what is it, perfection or whatever, um paralysis mm -hmm. and I just don't know how to move on. And then yeah. to eventually seek help, usually that takes I think that uh, in the previous episode, we we established other studies that sometimes takes eighty days or longer, eight months or like or eight years in some cases for mental issues to be recognized by the mm. person, and then to actually seek help from an expert. Yeah, uh, but is there anything like that any of us can do to rebuild and then maintain mental or? Yeah, work-life balance, like they say, which is yeah. what I don't necessarily believe in. But how do you get back to balance when you realize oh, something is getting out of hand here? Okay. Well, I think that the first step to that is recognizing that something is out of balance. Mm -hmm. Um, the, in in my experience, there are five steps towards emotional healing, um, and the first one is accepting and acknowledging accepting that there is a thing that isn't right accepting that this isn't the way that you want to feel accepting that the feelings you have that are keeping you where you are that are uh stressful or anxiety inducing or just plain horrible um accept that that is a thing and it's okay rather than simply saying well i'm just a bit stressed today and i'll just carry on as normal accepting something generally leads to um a position where you can start making changes so the first stage is to accept that there is a thing and it, and you're not happy with it the next stage is to understand it because you know as as, as researchers know you can't answer a question unless you understand it fully you can't um give a hypothesis unless you know um all of the details about the thing you're hypothesizing about so um, you know, you then have to prove that with, with evidence. And that's where the understanding really comes in, in terms of understanding your mind, understanding your body and your brain, and understanding all of the other factors that uh, that are impacting you. And a number of ways of doing that. Um, I'll come on to sort of a, a self-help form of that uh, in a moment. But um understanding it's absolutely key the third stage is then recognizing when that is happening recognizing when you are um, being triggered even if you're not entirely sure what the trigger is precisely or why it's there it's recognizing when you are in a state of unhealthy stress when you are in a state of anxiety or depression and knowing what that feels like so that you can say ah right yes i am feeling this way that then leads into the fourth step, which is change. And the change bit is really challenging. And some of us just want to get straight to the change because, you know, that's what we're after. But sometimes these other steps, or most often, to be fair, these other steps have to come in before we can create meaningful change. I mean, you take an antidepressant and that will change things for you one way or another, but it's not necessarily the whole answer. Mm. And so the change is based on your awareness that you've developed through your acceptance your understanding and your recognition of what's going on then you're in a position to be able to do things differently whether that is um, simply calming down calming down the stress reaction whether that's talking to yourself in a different way whether that is um, the healing of whatever's creating the, uh, the trigger and lots of different ways of change. Um, some of them we can do on our own. Some of them we will need some support with. And then finally, when you're kind of on the other side, you're not necessarily there at the finish line. The finish line doesn't really happen until our time on this earth is up. Um, so this is a lifelong thing. And it takes 
constant um, checking in and reviewing with yourself, um, even after sort of the main healing has happened, because there will always be layers, there will always be things coming up in the future. And just because we might heal a trauma or we might heal a situation doesn't mean we're never going to feel like that again. Um, the truth is, as human beings, we are always going to experience um, challenges and difficulties. And sometimes life just happens and it's really unfair. Um, but what this can do is build our resilience. It's like building our emotional resilience muscle mm -hmm. so that when life happens again in the future, we are better equipped because we're not coping with all of the stuff that's that's happened before. Um, in some part, we have been able to heal some of that. Mm -hmm. And it just puts us in a much stronger position when you are self-aware and you are self-knowing and you understand your brain and body and what's really going on. That helps you then deal with whatever the future wants to throw at you and um, and that can feel very empowering but it is a continual process of maintaining and continuing to develop your self-awareness mm -hmm. and it's that self-awareness that is key so i'm just going to come back to that um how to generate the understanding and and the the recognition of when it's happening and it does in part um relate to the triggers that you were talking about joe yeah. um it's very simply about checking in with yourself regularly and by regularly i mean several times a day try and develop a habit of doing that my uh, some people will put a, a little mark on the back of the hand to see it some people might wear a piece of jewelry or tie a rubber band around the wrist some people might set an alarm on their phone lots of ways of doing it to remind yourself to check in and all you need to do when you check in is ask yourself how am i doing what am i feeling in this moment and then to measure that on a scale of zero to 10, with zero being no no feeling at all, everything's fine, 10 being the most intense you can possibly imagine that feeling to be. So if you're feeling stressed, um, zero would be pina coladas on a beach without a care <laughs> in the world, and 10 would be you're going nuclear, that volcano is going to explode if it hasn't already. Where are you? And it's purely a subjective scale. Mm -hmm. But it helps you get your own frame of reference to where you are. And as you, the more you do this, the more you can recognize what level of intensity you are at some or most of the time. And when you do that, you can become aware that if you're constantly at a seven or a six or an eight, maybe that's not the best place to be. Because, of course, when you're at a six, seven or eight and something happens that triggers you, you can only go up. Whereas if your baseline is more around the two, three or four mark, then you may be triggered by an event, but it won't be quite as high. Mm -hmm. So it's much more controllable. So developing your self-awareness in this way by checking in with yourself mm -hmm. is hugely valuable. And mm -hmm. it's one of the first things that I ask anybody that I'm working with to start doing and to keep a record of it, just so that you know. If you want to expand that, you can then think of the situation that you're in and try and identify what is it about this situation that I'm reacting to. But you may uh -huh. not know, in which case you can add to this by then understanding what are your thoughts in that moment. So when you're checking in and let's say you're at a seven or an eight, just have a think, what are the words in my mind? And it doesn't matter if they're full sentences, if they're single words, if they're four letter words, doesn't matter. It's an, notice what the thoughts are. And again, you can make a little note of those. The next thing is to try and identify the emotions that you're experiencing. Not everybody can get to grips with this. Um, so if you're not sure what the emotions are called, you can try giving them a color. If that emotion that you're feeling were a color, what would it be? Mm -hmm. And how do you feel about that color? Um, but if you can name the emotion, um, you know, maybe anxiety. Well, if you're feeling anxiety, there are probably other emotions that are going on at the same time. Anxiety is a bit of an umbrella thing in some ways. And it often goes hand in hand with things like fear or anticipation or um, anger or nervousness or frustration. Mm -hmm. uh, there can be a lot of things all wrapped up in the word anxiety. So if you're feeling anxiety, ask yourself, is it just that or are there other emotions there as well? And as I say, if you struggle with naming emotions and just try identifying the color of those feelings, um, if they had a color, it may sound strange, but it works. And then finally, ask yourself what's happening in your body. Close your eyes, take a deep breath and feel your feet on the floor and ask yourself, what's my body telling me in this moment? And this is the this is one of the, the 
the most helpful things that you can do because when you recognize and tune into what your body is telling you then you're really tuning in with yourself and your self-awareness mm. and some people feel um can feel sensation all over the skin so body temperature can change you can get very hot cold you know cold sweats or hot sweats and um, you might notice your heart rate you might notice your stomach you might notice heaviness somewhere the list is 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 endless in terms mm. of what you can feel, but it's really paying attention to what your body is telling you in that moment. So those kind of five things, you know, how are you doing? What number is it on your scale of zero to 10? What are your thoughts? What are your emotions? And what's your body telling you? That level of self-awareness on its own will really help you understand exactly where you're at. So you can then decide whether that's a good place to be or whether you're there too often for comfort. And if right. you're there too often for comfort, then you can take a step back, take some time out and make a decision as to what's going to help you the most. Mm. Um, you know, so we can course correct um, and decide, is this something that I can deal with on my own? Is this something that I'm going to need some help with? Mm. Maybe I just need to connect with my community. Maybe I just need my friends. Maybe I just need to open up to somebody that I can trust and and be with them. You know, it's not necessarily always talking about your deep and meaningfuls. Sometimes it is just being with people in your life who are supportive. Because what happens with anxiety often makes us feel alone. Depression makes us feel alone. Stress and all of that pressure, it can feel very isolating, even if you do have a whole team of people around you doing the work. Um, and this is where the tribe comes in. This is where we really need people that we can connect with yeah. um, on a personal level, not just in a, in a workspace and develop those friendships and relationships. And if, if they're not there, if you find that you are quite an isolated person, that in itself is probably an indication that, yeah. you know, maybe there is something that you're dealing with on your own. Um, and maybe now it's time to think about, can that continue? Is dealing with it on your own actually working for you? Is it bringing you the change that you'll want? And if it's not, course correct. Mm. Do something different. Just as you would in your research project, if you're finding you're going down an avenue that's not getting you anywhere, you will probably change and go down a different avenue. It's just yeah, the same unless, with the research in yourself. Uh, yeah, unless I sorry, yeah, unless you feel that there must be something and need to find something. Because we assumed we would find something and now we're not finding anything. Like mm -hmm. many people miss the point of course correction and then find themselves dig digging into holes that are leading to nowhere. Yeah. And then money is running out, time is running out, people need to defend their thesis and their PhD within a certain time frame. And then there's only so little for another project <laughs> if one project turned out to not be so results giving. Um, so I want to, thanks for sharing um, this, basically a strategy and a self-assessment mm. and then to assess from there, do I want somebody to, as you said, um, can I, can I cause correct on my own or do I need guidance? And that's perfectly fine mm. um, to, mm. to not only consider, but to actually go and seek help with um, the, the understanding and recognizing aspect in the in the five points list um like oftentimes in my experience and also what um there's multiple stressor stressors in a working environment in academia oftentimes when people complain about they feel lonely they feel they don't get the leadership and the guidance that they would need at the same time they feel they should already know enough to mm. be able to perform to their own expectation of course expectations are usually way too high to be humanly yes. um, possible to accomplish um, and then the publication pressure many universities require their students to publish papers with, within like so before they can even think about um, handing in their thesis mm -hmm. um, I, do you think all of these <laughs> stresses need to be tackled at once or like is it better to uh, to seek a holistic approach or i mean it really depends on which but but i think also um like at this point it's it's important to identify what's stressing me is it right like mm. what is putting so much pressure into my brain mm. and is there like a 
events of some sort where I can release the pressure, where we can have a conversation with the PI, the group leader, and yeah. have him or her cross correct for for me. And then, yeah, I mean, it's all about seeking a conversation with everyone involved or like the decision makers involved. Yes, that can that can certainly be part of it. That can bring yeah. challenges in itself, depending on the people that you're working with, uh -huh. um, because it may be that there are issues within the team that are creating some of the stress. So they can be very, very challenging to address. Yeah. Um, that's a whole different uh, conversation. But in terms of whether to you know tackle everything at once or do it one thing at a time. Um, and whether we do it holistically or otherwise, well, yes, holistically. And by that, I mean, look at look at the three pillars of your life. And as I see them, the three pillars are lifestyle, mindset and physiology. So lifestyle is what it sounds like. It's the way that you live your life. It's the what you put into your body. It's um, where you put your body in uh, commuting and working and home life. It's the people around you and so on. Physiology is what it sounds like. It's understanding your own mm. biology and how your body works, how your brain and body works. Um, and so when you get stressed, when you get the stress reaction coming on, knowing how you can overcome that and how you can calm things down to give you more empowerment in that moment. Mm -hmm. And um, mindset, which, of course, is is key with everything. It's, you know, it's how you're thinking, why you're thinking the way that you are, how that thinking makes you feel Mm -hmm. and ultimately behave um so it it's those three pillars and um, they're all interconnected of course because lifestyle affects um how you think feel and behave and it affects your body and each of those other things affect everything else so they're all intertwined mm -hmm. but um what i would say is if you do notice something in your checking in exercise with yourself and you're thinking this isn't right this this isn't good mm -hmm. ask yourself how would you like it to be? If this could be different, what would be different? Mm -hmm. And how would that feel for you? That can give you an insight, if you answer that question honestly, into the thing that you may decide you want to tackle first. Mm -hmm. um, when I'm encouraging people to make changes, do not change your entire life all at once because it's far too overwhelming mm -hmm. and That's it's not so realistic cool. and it's not sustainable. I suggest pick one thing that feels doable. It may be that you get a, you have to commute to wherever it is that you're working. Mm. And if the way that you're commuting is just awful mm. and it causes you a lot of stress before you even get to your place of work, then maybe think about that in and of itself. Is there a way to reduce the commute? Is there a different way of doing things? You know, if it's to do with where you're situated. So in, if you're working in a workplace and you're not on your own, um, and if it's the people around you that are that you're finding is disturbing, then can you move? Can you yeah. change where you're situated to give yourself a bit more peace and quiet? You know, one small thing that perhaps you can control, yeah. that you can ask for, that you may need to involve other people with, um, change that one thing and see how that feels. Because when you change one thing, it will have a ripple effect. Oh. One of the ripples is that it will increase your confidence to make positive changes for your own course correction. Um, but trying to do it all at once, no. Don't even go there. Please do not have that expectation oh. on yourself because it will all go horribly wrong and nothing will change. It's really about baby small steps and noticing afterwards, now I've done this thing, how has it changed things? Mm. And again, you're repeating the process of the five stages. Yeah. So that you can add this new insight into your own self-awareness and go from there and yeah. then make change and so on. Does that make sense? Totally. Yeah. And I think now that you explained that also in academia, many of the reasons is that stress us out is it's the first time in a different country often when people pursue their PhD is a strange culture it's not necessarily the workplace because there hopefully everybody speaks for the most part English or a language we understand sometimes the language we are about to learn but the cultural setting that we expose ourselves to can be exciting and like make us curious about it but it's also 
is also scary to some extent it's foreign yeah. so we, there's a lot of insecurities and unknowns and then the pressure on and at work on top of that so it's also mm -hmm. i think a normal thing for people as they grow up and explore the world um yeah and people in their early 20s and then moving forward that's also where other people outside of academia <laughs> i mean also some academics start a family and then academics often then find they have the luxury of taking the time <laughs> to start a family some do so there are all these um yeah normal so to say things not necessarily academic things that stress us out as academics and then there's a, like the aforementioned academic stressors like publishing and um, pu pressure to publish competition mm -hmm. um leadership or lack thereof um the feeling and notion of oh i should do all of this by myself i should already know everything because now now i'm here i'm doing a phd so people look up to me and it's, i'm i'm expected to to be so knowledgeable and i feel i'm not like imposter syndrome is everywhere in academia <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> uh, yeah and not only there so um so as we said in the beginning academics are not so special with how they experience mental health issues um also like looking at the time and coming towards an end but not without um maybe we could also have done this in the beginning but um what it makes as much sense to also tackle this now what is your understanding with your expertise your experience of mental well-being how would you consider a healthy state of mind oh and, gosh <laughs> okay that's a little bit maybe too too much to ask for but no, no, considering, no, no. <laughs> considering <laughs> also like we established the, the brain is just another organ and it's difficult to study and usually we study it with the brain with all its you know complexity and limitations and and biases mm -hmm. that that that's come along but <laughs> um yeah and and then also like physical fitness is also very like there's not one status so just to take off that pressure like mm. not, i'm not expecting you to say okay this is what it looks like and then everybody's happy like this is probably not how it goes yeah but well, what... ex ex it's exactly that it's it's unique to the individual what mental health looks like and feels like or what good mental health looks like and feels like and um, but I'm often drawn to the the World Health Organization um, defines mental health. It's not an absence of mental disorder. So it's not just not being depressed or not having anxiety or not having OCD or anything like that. It is a state of well-being um, in which every individual realizes his or her own potential and can cope with the normal stresses of life can work productively and fruitfully and is able to make a contribution to his or her community. That's the World Health Organization definition of mental wellness and mental good mental health. And I think what's important to take from that is that it's not the absence of disease or difficulty. It's not the absence of challenge. It's not the absence of sometimes, quite frankly, the shit that life throws at us. Mm. It is the presence of resilience that emotional resilience muscle that we talked about and um, we need to work on that and to build that it's the presence of um peace when we want it in ourselves it's the presence of our ability to grow it's the presence of harmony within ourselves um and with others and um, harmony in our in our feelings and thoughts and harmony in our environment and our relationships um you know it's a very it's a place of positive positive healthy peace and energy as opposed to just an absence of awful stuff mm. um sometimes we can feel well i'm okay i haven't got any problems at the moment so i'm okay that doesn't necessarily mean that you are mentally well or emotionally well it just means that you haven't got a load of stuff to deal with right now mm. um it might mean that should um you know, should things get difficult and more challenging as you go, you won't have that resilience. So it is definitely a presence of 
goodness, a presence of resilience, a presence of wellness, and that feeling of well-being that each of us can really only describe to ourselves what we, well-being feels like, um, you know, because it's a very personal thing and well-being for one person will feel very different to somebody else's well-being. Mm -hmm. And it's important to find yours. But yeah. it isn't just an absence of stuff. It's an actual presence of something, something positive, something that lifts you, something mm. that gives you peace and harmony with yourselves. And I think that's what's really important to take. Yeah, which definition. has come to mind, as, as you said, that's like everybody's different. We all know that we work well, um, like each of us works well in a different working condition and also like workplace some people like it buzzing um around they like big offices with many people mm. um others need their quiet corner all by themselves some people like to listen to music as they work through tables and numbers others need absolute silence so these yeah. are this is the variety of human natures human characters and each is very much needed and wanted in society and has a right to um, find conditions under under which we all perform our best in under yeah yeah it um, is and also what from the world health organization's definition that you said isn't it also that once we've been through anxiety or like any any mental health what's considered as a disorder or a crisis situation or like um where we were dysfunctional for some time doesn't mean that we cannot be mentally well again absolutely so like absolutely also what i think some people i've also met who like people who went through depression like myself and then they feel now i'm sick for life but i i refuse to label myself as sick i might have sick episodes like i sometimes catch a flu like sometimes yeah. i have a depressive episode and I know I will pass because like just like a flu will pass. And I know mm. I can cope and look after myself to make it pass quicker, potentially. So yeah. it's just a matter of learning like, like the resilience that you've like we make experiences, our systems collapse sometimes, but as long as it's still alive and kicking, like we're good to go. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And I think that's that's an expectation that is unrealistic sometimes that, um, yes, even if we can get better from this thing, we expect life to be a bed of roses afterwards. And of course it's not because challenges still happen and there will be times and periods in our life when we feel better than others. And there'll be times that are really challenging and can be really difficult to get through. Mm. Again, it's kind of accepting that that's a situation. Life isn't going to be a Zen-like state of bliss all the way through, far from it. Mm -hmm. But the wellness factor comes from knowing that you can ride those waves. Mm -hmm. You can ride them and you can get to the other side. So if it's a, a wave of positivity, it's great. Love it while it lasts. That's fantastic. If it's <laughs> a wave of depression coming one, back, <laughs> <laughs> if it's a wave of depression yeah. coming back, then again, do all of the right things help yourself in the best way that you can and you will come out of it again and it may be that the next time if depression strikes again um you know if you have worked through a lot of those things if it comes again it may not last as long and it won't be as deep mm -hmm. um, you know there is in all things there is change so it's ride the wave ride the wave of wherever you are and that no. works for both ends of the of the spectrum does that make sense a lot. Thank you. And also, again, thanks for the um, it's like the crisis mode assessment strategy, but now for performing professionals and performing scholars, do you have as a farewell note and hopefully see you soon note, note um, as we um, come to an end for this episode, um, do you have like one or three or one to three tips on how to keep a balance with energy levels in high performing work, high performance work, working environments like research teams? Like what's <laughs> a, a very quick assessment that you could leave us with? Yeah, to to just assess the situation on an ongoing basis. It's the check-in process that I mentioned earlier on. Um, that can be a difficult habit to get into, which is why you may need a bit of help 
with creating that habit, which is why some people wear a rubber band around their wrist or a piece of jewelry or a set of phone alarm. But checking in with yourself is the first step to any of this self-awareness, because if you're not doing that, then you are not raising your head above the parapet to actually take a look at your circumstances and know how you're feeling. And you can't change anything unless you have an awareness that something needs to be changed. So that's definitely the first step. Mm-hmm. Um, when you notice that stress is too high um, or you're feeling uncomfortable, then a very simple way of, of resolving that is to literally remove yourself from the situation. Go somewhere else, take a break. If you're working at a computer, take a step back, go outside, breathe fresh air. If you're working in a lab and there's lots of you know hustle and bustle around you, go somewhere quiet. Literally remove yourself, take a break, take five, take 10, take however long that you need because... Um, we need to take breaks. We need to um, just allow our brains to reset and recharge even just a little bit throughout the day. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it can feel that five minutes isn't enough. I'm not going to get any proper rest, but actually you're, it's, it's like, um, it's like a, a, a boiler being under really high pressure and all of the dials are over on the red and the boiler's rattling and it's about to explode because the temperature's too high and the, the water pressure's too high and so on. Taking a step back, taking a deep breath, going for a walk, what you're doing is you're releasing pressure from that boiler. You're making it more stable and it's just the same with your own physiology. Mm-hmm. And if you continue to do that and get in the habit of checking in and when you notice your um, anxiety or stress or whatever it is, is too much, Take a small action to step away and change that state, then you will be doing really, really well. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Brilliant. Okay, now we're all well equipped. So if you think this episode was not for you, yes, it was, because we all run into stressful situations rather often. Um, and if you find that yes this was very much what i'm experiencing then you can either reach out to us also to kate directly so we'll leave your um mm. contact details in the show notes and in the blog post related to this recording happy to have a chat with anybody if they need it yeah and also for a, a crisis assessment um call thanks for offering that um, or also not a crisis just if you want to to explore the topic further you can also email us we have a series of podcasts on the topic co- more coming um and as also um, in in previous episodes we mentioned primo the researcher mental health observatory an institution or a group of researchers who who have taken on mental health as a topic for academics and building um, research literature, how mental health issues affect academia, how academia affects mental health, Mm -hmm. unfortunately, and also what we can do about it. My personal approach is that if we practice open science, basically good scientific practices with digital tools that we have readily available nowadays, what we teach in our courses, we can avoid a lot of the stressors that we've talked about here to preserve and maintain one's mental well-being but still we're not um we still might be triggered by certain situations certain actions certain words that are being said and just know that's pretty much normal and part of life Mm, absolutely absolutely thank you so much for allowing me to be here joe i really enjoyed chatting about it i know i have a tendency to waffle on sometimes but i just love the subject so much and and i wish they taught all of this in school I really do. So thanks for the opportunity to be here. It's a great pleasure and a great honor having you. And I'm sure we hear more from you in this ecosystem called Academia and also in this room or space called Access to Perspectives. Thanks for joining us today again. Thanks so much.